want to talk tonight about where we are and why we are here and such a contrast that has taken place in my own life so it makes it all the more vivid. I remember when I was uh, younger there was a television personality named Fulton Sheen. Now Fulton Sheen was highly gifted, very intelligent, personally charismatic, learned, well-traveled, uh, almost as modest as myself. <laughs> and he had a television program. His program was number one. Nielsen ratings would have him number one over everybody else. Fox News, down here. CBS News, down here. He beat them all. And he got, thank you very much, he got, he got an award one time for these, what is it, television things, Emmys or, right. And Milton Burrow, the comedian who was there, he wanted to demand to know how he beat, uh, you know, how Sheen beat him. And Sheen told me, he says, well, I've got very good writers. Burrow said, well, I want to know who they are. He said, Matthew, Mark, Lou, and John. And to show you how quick a mind he had, she was giving a talk one time, and the village atheist happened to show up. And this was at, at a college, I think in Southern California, I'm not 100% sure, but he was at a college. And this guy was interrupting him, a heckler, and Sheen said, okay, I'll, I'll take your question. So this college atheist said, do you believe that Jonah was actually swallowed by the whale and stayed there for a couple of days. She said, well, yes I do. So he went on with the talk. Well, that didn't satisfy this agitator. He busted in with some more questions. And he said, well, how can we believe that? How, how, do, you, how do you know that? And Fulton Sheen said, well, when I get to heaven, I'll ask him. And that seemed to satisfy the guy for a little while. Then went on again with one more question. Now this was starting to get to Sheen a little bit. And the agitator said, well, if when you get to heaven, Jonah's not there, then what? Sheen shot back and said, then you can ask him. <laughs> so that is how quick he was. Now, I tell you that only to contrast an episode that happened about maybe two weeks ago in the Pennsylvania legislature. It's a young woman named Stephanie Borowitz, a state representative, kind of like the same thing as the delegate is in Virginia. She was asked by the speaker to give the invocation. Well, she gave an invocation, and uh, I had Kathy, my wife, listen to it, and I said, do you hear anything wrong with this? She said, no. Nope. She wondered why I asked. I said, well, what she did, she prayed for the peace of Jerusalem. She prayed for the governor, who later denounced her. She, she said um, she was glad that Trump was supporting Israel. And she was kind of like sorry because the nation had forgotten God. Well, that's no different than what Alexander Solzhenitsyn said at his Templeton address in 1983. And for this temerity, she mentioned Jesus 13 times, though. But I don't know, that agitated some of these people. She was denounced as xenophobic, homophobic, Islamophobic, and racist. Now that's quite a bit right there, because she didn't mention Muhammad or Islam or any of the biological races uh, you know, on the, uh, on the earth. She garnered the hatred of all these people. And this one representative up there put in a bill basically saying, well, you can't mention the name of Jesus. You can't do this. You can't pray for Jerusalem. I thought, well, okay. There used to be a First Amendment in this country in which this is allowed. And in fact, this crazy guy from Philadelphia cited a case that was decided in 2014, the city of Greece. It's a city in New York. I can't think of the last name. But anyway, he cited this case as reasons why she couldn't do it. I happen to read the case. Now, you, if you hear a liberal, you automatically know what they're saying is false. 
<laughs> or incomplete, or both. I read the case, it's just the reverse of what this guy said. This was Anthony Kennedy giving the decision. And I looked up Politico, which is an agitprop organ of the Washington Post, and they even acknowledged when this case came out that about, I think 15% of all, 15 or 19 percent, one of those two figures, of all the prayers said in Congress mentioned the name of Jesus. Well, nobody falls over, lightning didn't strike the building, but this is where we are right now. Now, why are we in this position? I would suggest we're in that position because too many Christians have pulled back from the public square. We're not there. If we were there, and again, this, I mean, this is a tedious thing to do, and it's not easy, but if we were there, either as officials or as precinct people or as members of a you know, party doing something, nobody would even dare breathe this. But we have pulled back, and power, <laughs> the horse of vacuum, and it's being filled by people who are completely antithetical to what we believe, to what we want to do. Remember, Jesus told us to be the light of the world, the salt of the earth, and the leaven of society. He told us this. This is not Bob Marshall saying this. This is not Pat Robertson saying it, or Jerry Falwell years ago. It's the Lord of creation saying this. But if we are to follow Christ's command, remember he was specific about it, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. How do we do this if we don't know Caesar's world? The answer is you can't do it. Remember, the Israelites were supposed to you know, build walls around their city, Nehemiah. I suppose Nehemiah didn't have any carpenters who knew how to put framing up, or stonemasons who knew how to put these building blocks there. They couldn't do it. They had to have knowledge. The children of light are oftentimes much less wise in the ways of the world than those who are pursuing the other agenda. People of faith have to act in the civic arena starting in their own neighborhood. It is from your neighborhood that you affect a policy in your school, in Richmond, in Washington, and in the middle of Africa. The foreign policy, the reason I say that is because Catholic bishops were really having a hard time with United States State Department under uh, the you know, lady who uses hammers on cell phones. She said, we'll help you fight Boko Haram, but you have to have homosexual this, homosexual that, pass out birth control to these girls. They said, forget it. We're not doing it. So that was in cultural imperialism, sexual imperialism from the United States over to Africa. It starts in your precinct. Every level of, of government office, of government power, starts in your precinct. Daniel, the book of Daniel, described Daniel and his associates as showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. That meant they had knowledge of the government where they were living. That made them better servants of the Creator. Not worse, better. Hosea 4.6, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee. That's very frightening words. But scripture accounts that the Lord uses people who have knowledge of the civic order to accomplish his will. Joseph was sold into slavery. Joseph, the coat of many colors. Became second in command in Pharaoh's court. Moses was raised by Pharaoh's daughter. He could go up and talk to Pharaoh because he was raised in the, the, the court system. He knew how to get in there, he knew how to get out, he knew who to talk to, he knew how to be quiet. He didn't have a wife at the time, so he had that dog tell him. So. Hey, hey, hey. St. Paul, who was having a fight with the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was kind of like the Roman or the, the Jewish Senate. They wanted him to stop preaching Christ crucified. What did St. Paul do? Did he read the book of Acts? No. 
Festus was the Roman governor, and he was ready to pitch Paul to the lions over here, and they were going to shut him, shut him all down. And Paul said, you can't do that to me. And I'm sure that Festus probably bristled, what do you mean I can't do to you? I'm the governor. Paul said, I am a Roman citizen. You cannot subject a Roman citizen to a power that claims superiority to Rome. Festus probably would have, you know, dropping his false teeth if he had a little bit more. And he said, oh, okay, you're a Roman citizen, you will go to Rome. And here's Paul defending, there was no First Amendment in the Roman Empire, but in effect what we would call First Amendment rights of speech, that the government could clamp it down. He used his knowledge of Roman law to defend preaching Christ. If he did it, so can we. Planned Parenthood, LGBTQ, XYZ, whatever the hell those alphabets are. Socialists are pressuring school boards, courts, and state legislatures, and Congress to remove Christians and Christian principles from the public square. They are acting like, and they're getting prepared to act like, dictators. Joseph Stalin in the Soviet Union, Chairman Mao in China, Adolf Hitler in Germany, and Plutarco Kaya is in Mexico. In Washington right now, this is H.R. 5. It's called the Equality Act. So you know when liberals describe it, it's exactly the reverse. It's not equality. This is submission. Submission of those marked with the sign of faith to get out of the public square. But we're going to tell you how you're going to get out of the public square. This is masked under the rubric of preventing discrimination. Except the discrimination goes against people who have the sign of faith in their life. This would make religion, I'm sorry, it would make sexual orientation or gender identity, whatever those things are, equivalent to race. Now what that means is, somebody says, you know, secretly I am X, you can't fire me because of this. And if you're a church and you have a, a school and you expect the teachers to live according to the behavior outline of the Ten Commandments or the Beatitudes or the traditions of faith, you will not be able to fire that teacher because it will be same as firing them for grounds of race. All this is ridiculous, but folks, right now, there are 240 members of the House of Representatives who are co-patrons on the bill. When you add the patron, that's 241. You know what a majority of the House of Representatives is? 218. They've already got this in the bag. Seven of the 11 representatives, members of Congress from Virginia, are co-patrons on this bill, including the woman who represents this very restaurant, Jennifer Weston. Don Byer, Jerry Conley, Byer and Conley supposedly Catholics. So Bobby Scott, uh, the two uh, two ladies that were uh, that were just uh, just elected uh, in, in 2018. This will make it impossible for churches to keep their tax status if they don't perform homosexual weddings. They're not going to shut them down, but they're going to cripple them. You will not be able to keep your tax status if you have a male-only clergy. You can't do it. If you don't accept the new teaching standards, which would include the sexual orientation stuff, how will you keep your accreditation? All Saints School may be jeopardized in its ability to satisfy the compulsory education laws. So this is where they want to go. Oh, they're smiling, very nice pretending they're protecting against discrimination. Oh no. This is to kick us completely, effectively, and permanently out of the public square. This is going to be like in Eastern Europe in the 1940s after World War II. I have relatives over there. They used to tell us stories all the time. The only jobs you're going to have are day labor jobs. You will not be a teacher because you won't be certified as credential because you're a bigot. You won't be in the profession, law, because if you don't accept two guys getting married or whatever it is, 
You're going to be, you're not going to be credentialed. You won't have a law license. You won't be able to practice medicine if you are discriminating on the basis of sex. This is the mini version of the ERA, in effect. And the ERA, Henry Hyde said, basically likens um, sex to race. You're not going to be able to say no to doing an abortion or paying tax money for abortion because you're making a sexual distinction. This is 241 people in Congress right now want to do this. Folks, we're in big trouble. In Virginia this year, we had the so-called Equal Rights Amendment. I, because the voters in my district wanted me to spend a lot of time reading, they, they took me out of public office and I did spend a lot of time reading and I read every hearing on the Equal Rights Amendment about 90 some percent of the floor debate, law, law cases, court decisions, books, monographs, law reviews, probably about seven or 8,000 pages. And I was able to digest this material and give it to our Republican colleagues in Richmond. Well, six Republicans voted in the Senate down there and voted for this thing. We won because of an odd situation. There were 50 Republicans who voted against this, but there were several of those in there who would have voted for it if it came for an up or down vote, but they followed the party leadership because of the procedural process that the other side was doing or was using. So we've lost on that. There's probably 53% of the House of Delegates that would have voted for this if they got it. And with seven of the 11 members of Congress, that's like about 65% of Virginians are represented by people who want to shut your church down if Christ is number one. Now, how did we get here? We got here because we pulled back. We are not the salt of the earth. We are not the leaven of society. And we're not the light of the world anymore. Does it have to stay that way? Nope. Is it written in some book? Nope. Doesn't have to stay that way. There are 2,567 precincts in Virginia. Are there 2,567 Christians spread out, dispersed across the Commonwealth for one family to run each precinct? I don't know. Doesn't seem like a big issue. Now, look, running a precinct is not easy. But you better consider doing this or helping somebody to do this. And you can be a high school senior and do this. You don't even have to be a voter to do this. You just have to know what you're doing and methodically carry this out. If you do this, you can reverse the extended. Let me give you a few more of what's going on. Dianne Feinstein in 2017 criticized a federal court of appeals Trump nominee, Amy Coney Barrett. She was a Catholic because, and this is what Feinstein said, many of us have this uncomfortable feeling that in your case, the dogma lives loudly within you. And that is a concern. Well, apparently killing nearly 61 million children under the Supreme Court's 1973 decision, which is full of more lies than I can possibly count, is not a concern for Senator Feinstein. Another judge for the Court of Appeals in the District of Columbia, can't think of his name, but who, that woman from Hawaii, Senator Hirano, whatever, you know, the one who said to all the men, sit down and shut up, very delicate. <laughs> probably writing an etiquette book she identified the Knights of Columbus as a hate group hate group? they help disabled children they help families this is a hate group you cannot take liberals at their word because they reverse the meaning of words they do this constantly you cannot allow this to continue and expect to be free to practice your religion, to defend your family with any degree of certainty. Abandoning government to secular atheists has dire consequences for ourselves, our families, our state, our country, and the church. A Woodrow Wilson poll, foundation poll, 1,000 American citizens found only 19% of those 45 and under who passed the citizenship naturalization test. 
19%. Citizens hostile to the natural law or who are ignorant of the Constitution and its due process requirements are easily led by demagogues. And that's why liberals, with their new math, they can equate three states to ratify an Equal Rights Amendment with the 38 that the Constitution says you have to have. You have to have three fourths, but it, it means 38. Remember, these are the same people who think men can become women despite wishing it. So you're not going to have very fruitful discussions with those people, but you're going to have to go out. What is the, one of the first things that Christ told his, uh, his apostles? The world will hate you. Other than that, the second, the second thing, because it hated me before you, go out baptizing some men, all men. How did that happen? All men. We have to be apostolic with the words and go out into our community. And if you can't walk that road, make a phone call. But you've got to create a sense of community to reinstitute the Christian social structure. When Bishop Sheen was on television, the assumptions behind the civil order were Judeo Christian. I have the slightest idea what the assumptions behind this is. Gnostic mythology, pagan, you know, witchcraft, I, anything, any one of those things will go. But we can't do that because it's the leaving of the Pharisees that's now operating our government. Pius XI, in 1937, he told German parents, this is when you were in big trouble in Germany. I mean, he was still kind of immune from some of the consequences of this. He said, none can free you from the, this is to the German Catholics, none can free you from the responsibility God has placed on you over your children. The eternal judgment asked, where are those I confided to you? So we do have this responsibility. We have to, we have to do this or not only we're in trouble, our country's in trouble. And some of these things are irreversible beyond a certain point. I have no idea what that point is, but I don't want to walk up to the edge of the cliff and see how close I can jump before I fall over. We're being pushed at that point. Our back is against the wall. There are candidates here tonight, but I urge you to seriously support, either with money or with time or a bumper strip or a yard sign. One of the difficulties I had was that a lot of my, and I had people walk door to door, and one of my better walkers is back there in the, in the back here. Precincts where we could walk, we won. Precincts where we couldn't walk to match the opponents, we lost. It's that simple. Kathy and I were walking at a precinct over near uh, Sudley Manor Road. And in a space of about 35 minutes, we ran into six Planned Parenthood precinct workers. How did I know they were Planned Parenthood? They had their stupid hats on, matched by equally tasteless sh shirts, mentioning Planned Parenthood. Well, multiply six times 17 precincts, about 105. That's a lot of people going door to door. I didn't have that. And that's my fault. I didn't get them. But part of my problem was, Marshall, you'll never lose to a candidate like you're running against. I said, oh, yes, I can, because Hillary won my precincts better than Obama did. Folks, the only difference is they're going out and doing this work. You don't have to have a PhD. You don't have to be a lawyer. As a matter of fact, it's probably better if you're not a lawyer. Because you'll think too much. But average people, high school students going out and walking door to door can create a sense of community and an obligation and almost admiration from the people, the voters who see them. We have got to do this. The law can be on our side. As a matter of fact, when Jimmy Carter, who was for the extension of the ERA, his own uh, assistant attorney general in the Justice Department, he said, look, this is a 19, the ERA passed in 1980, 1972, March 22nd. It was due to expire March 22nd, 1979. The ERA opponents, um, proponents figured out they were going to lose. They couldn't get 38 states is what, what they needed. So they wanted to extend the time. Nobody had ever done this before. 
And Congress previously, in Dillon versus Gloss in 1921, had said we have no doubts that Congress can set dates for ratification. And, it, it, and, and that's it. John Harmon, Assistant Attorney General, said, certainly if the time limit has expired, but this is when this fight was going on, before an intervening Congress has taken action to extend that limit, a strong argument can be made that the only constitutional means of reviving a proposed amendment would be to propose the amendment anew by two-thirds vote of each house. Congresswoman Griffiths, this is the lady who sponsored it. I think it's perfectly proper to have a seven-year statute so it could not be hanging around our heads forever. Senator Harkey, a supporter of the resolution, also said, if there is such a delay beyond the seven years, then we must begin the entire process again. That you would think that would solve it. And again, a federal court later uh, said that Congress had no authority to extend it. So it should have been dead March 22nd, 79. Last summer, I saw a uh, ERA uh, kind of a, a uh, hearing, informal hearing, with ERA proponents. Jerry Naylor, he said, if I become, if the Democrats take over the House, they did, he will become the chairman of the Judiciary Committee. He's chairman there right now, and what he said was, I will hold hearings on the ERA, either putting it in brand new, or just extending it by three states. Why did he want to do this? One reason. At the time this fake or the bogus hearing was going on, the controversy was over Mr. Trump's nominee for the Supreme Court, Justice Kavanaugh. Nadler said, look, we can't be sure that the Supreme Court is going to keep upholding this. Why can't they be sure? Because they made up the whole decision. Lawrence Tribe of Harvard said there's no, there's no rationale for the abortion conclusion in the U.S. Constitution. Matter of fact, in 1868, when the uh, 16th and 14th Amendment was passed, states were passing anti-abortion laws all at the same time. So that the people who are ratifying the 14th Amendment also said we need to protect unborn children. Nadler is fearful that Trump's going to appoint more nominees. Well, he won't if he won't be not going to get reelected in 2020. That he's going to appoint more nominees and they're going to reverse this decision and throw it back to the states. That's why they want the Equal Rights Amendment. Because let me tell you what, if the ERA passes, you could be a combination of Mother Teresa and Justice Scalia. It's going to mean abortion at that time. That's the reason they want this. And when I read the hearings, remember March 22nd, 1972 is 10 months to the day before the Roe and Doe decisions of January 22nd, 1973. They wanted the ERA to provide the constitutional underpinning for abortion. Real simple. They wanted it for same-sex marriage. They were, they were going down this road, they didn't want to admit it to everybody, but they were doing it, and Justice Ginsburg, who says her favorite amendment, is the Equal Rights Amendment. So, you can stop this, and I'll just go back to this original theme, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Well, I put a book together that encapsulates my six years on Capitol Hill, 26 years in the Virginia General Assembly, about 15 years of researching public policy. You don't have to go through all this. I've done it for you. My wife edited the book, so. You <laughs> so that means you can understand it. <laughs> so please do not accept despair. Despair is, is the tool of the devil. There's always hope. But you gotta, you gotta get up and fight. You gotta do some of these things. It's not comfortable. It, it, it takes your time. And again, if you can't walk door to door, find your grandson or your son to do this. Read this and, and know what logistically you have to do. Let me give you an example. I was uh, in about 19, I'm sorry, 2002 or three. I was talking to a member of Congress from Virginia. You would know his name. He went to Yale University. I'm not going to say his name, but that's what I want to tell you. And I said, look, why don't you put in a bill to strip the Supreme Court of the ability to even hear these cases? 
And he looked at me like, what are you talking about? He says, you can't do that. I said, yes, you can. He said, no, you can't. I said, yes, you can. I said, look, I'm going to solve this real quick. I went over, I looked around his room, picked a book off his shelf, big fat book, maroon leather binding, Library of Congress, Legislative Research Division, American Law Division. I opened the book to Article 3, go down to Section 3. I said, read this. He goes and he says, I didn't know you could do that. I thought to myself, how did you graduate from Yale? You're in Congress, and I'm sitting here, and I went to law school for one semester, had Spiro Agnew as a teacher, decided I'm not going to be a lawyer. <laughs> and I know that, but you don't. They didn't know it. Well, three years later, and I, I put this in the book, three years later, Congressman Hostetler from Indiana did introduce a bill to do that. And it passed the House of Representatives. It went to the Senate. You knew who controlled the Senate at the time? The Republicans. You know who was president at the time? A Republican. You know what they did? Absolutely nothing. The decision invalidating the, the laws that only allowed for real marriage could have been preempted had the Senate passed them. They did nothing. So, again, I, I put things in my book to let you know if a congressman or state representative is trying to fool you. Because I know all these tricks. I know how to do them. I helped uh, devise the original Hyde Amendment. A friend of mine about took uh, a Freedom of Information Act, and I show you how to do it at the floor. Walked up to a congressman I knew from the, a group called the Young Americans for Freedom, which was founded by the Buckley family. And I was in it when I was in high school and college, and so was this congressman. I pulled him off the floor of the house, and I said, hey, we have got to, to get a, a, a vote on abortion. Now, I had the FOIA that my friend had gotten from, was then Health, Education, and Welfare. I said that about 280,000 kids have been killed with tax money. I said, I find this bizarre on a number of grounds. We need to have a vote. Now, at that time, the Catholic bishops were opposed to anything other than, they weren't pro-abortion, but tactically, they were thinking the only thing they wanted to work on was a constitutional amendment. Nice to have disagreement after disagreement with these people. And I said, look, this is like you want to play the Yankees in the World Series, and you haven't even won a T-ball game. You can't do that. You've got to work your way up with victories here, with exercising everything and seeing how people are going to vote. Are they really going to be with you or not? We gave this amendment to the congressman. He gave it to another congressman from, uh, no, he said, there's a freshman here who I think is interested in this. I said, OK. About six weeks later, I opened up, it was the Washington Star at that point, no Washington Post, I didn't read that. Um, and it was an amendment on the labor, uh, on the labor HEW bill offered by Henry Hyde. And it won. I thought, wow, we did two things. We're gonna cut off funding for killing kids, and we got a record vote where people had to go on record one way or the other. That means you can measure their performance. Not, I'm really with you, I love you in the closet, but not outside. Sorry, stay with me in public and in private. And then when Amen. Kathy and I worked for Bob Dorn, and I, I did that with several other uh, measures on the District of Columbia bill, uh, the foreign aid bill for the State Department, uh, Indian, uh, Indian, and then District of Columbia, like four other bills of military. We cut off abortions in the military, abortion funding. So it just started from a simple little thing like that. I'm no different than anybody else that had opportunities and I was able to exercise them. I want to give this knowledge to you so you can give it to your grandsons, your sons, your neighbors, your, your brothers, your sisters, whomever. We can take back the country. It's not impossible. It's going to take, it's a four-letter word called work. But we've got to do it. The only choice is persecution. I mean, you could not have gotten somebody to say to a, a woman, a lawyer from Notre Dame, the dogma lives loudly within you. What are you doing? No Catholics apply. 
Remember Article 6 of the Constitution, no religious tests for holding an office? They're imposing religious tests on us now. And we're basically backing into accepting it. Can't do that, folks. There's no middle ground here. Let me stop when you ask questions. Folks, thank you for your attention. I'm glad nobody fell asleep. And uh, just please, in this order, pray, think, and act. PTA. Thank you.